Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Uh, I'm not going to share this message today because I'm assuming anything. I'm just doing a message today to what I call we're checking in. And um, actually, I preached this message. I've changed some of it and added some things this time. But last year at the couples retreat, uh, I taped this message in the connect room and they showed it on the Friday night of the opening session. And uh, so I said, Pastor, why not let me take that same message to all the rest of the congregation that never gets to go to a retreat or haven't, didn't go this year to a retreat and let me bring a retreat to them? He said, great idea. So uh, here we are. We're, we're going to bring you a message that I shared with the couples retreat last year. That today, we're going to have a giant retreat right here in this service. The next thing uh, I want you to think about is to think about building your relationship from this point on to rebuild a fresh and a new. Notice I said, I'm not saying you aren't rebuilding and you aren't building. I'm saying to uh, start a fresh and a new today. And the reason I'm saying that is because, and I would say this at all the retreats over the years, is that um, you you could be sitting here and you were one that was remarried. And you're going to hear things today that may make you feel a little uncomfortable, but you listen very, very, very closely and you'll be fine. Because the point is, this is where you are today. And this is where you are in your relationship today, so you build from there. Secondly, singles, you might be single again, and you may still just be single, and you may have an interest in this type of uh, experience in the future at, at this time, and you may not have any desire, and you may really have a desire to be married. All of you, just listen carefully, because there will be things you will hear today that you can help incorporate in your life, and those listening online as well, and incorporate in your life, and, and not just in a marital setting, but there's going to be a lot of principles that will be shared today that are good for friendships, just good old-fashioned relationships with people. So think in those terms and be a part of that today. I want to start with saying that the book of Song of Solomon, which will take most of our teaching today, consists of six poems. And the Hebrew word for the title of the book, Song of Solomon, actually means in the Hebrew the greatest song, the greatest song. So it's been regarded as the greatest wedding songs of ever, all wedding songs were ever penned, that were ever penned. This book was, a, was written to remind us of the divine origin. Notice I said the divine origin because we can go back to Genesis chapter three and see that divine origin at work. To remind us of the joy and the dignity of human love in marriage. And the book is also an analogy of Christ and his church. So there's a, there's a double-fold impact and application we get from the book of Song of Solomon. Although sin was marred with this all-important institution that God created, God wants us to know that it can be pure, it can be wholesome, and it can be beautiful, just the way he always intended marriage to be. Song of Solomon also was written as a corrective message between two extremes that were going on in history at the time of its writing. Number one was the abandonment of married love for all kinds of sexual perversion that existed. It was written to correct that perversion in marriage. Now, if you are an Old Testament reader, you will see an awful lot of perversion with God's people, not just with mankind, but also with God's chosen people. And the second reason it was written was as an asceticism, often mistaken, as the Christian view of sex that denies the goodness of physical love in the marriage covenant. 
In other words, uh, asceticism means avoidance of all forms of indulgence. And what some believed in that day was they certainly weren't involved in any perversion. These people only thought you should be intimate when you were bearing a child. And if you weren't bearing a child, you shouldn't do this act. That's how strict and that's how far off they were. And God didn't approve of that because God created the most beautiful thing when he created the ability of man and woman to make love together. And he created it with the idea that they should spend time with each other and enjoy each other. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. I have a strong urge to call this message today, the beginning. That's what we're calling it, the beginning. The idea of the beginning was to go back. In fact, do you remember the time when in Revelations chapter two, when Jesus was speaking to the Ephesus church? You remember what he said to the church? He says, he, he complimented them with all kinds of wonderful things. But he says, I have this one thing against you. He says, you have lost your first love. You've lost your first love. He didn't say they didn't love him at all. They said, you've lost your first love. He says, I want you to come back and I want you to love me as you did at first. But, and I want you to keep doing all the things you were doing. So there were a lot of right things they were doing, but he noted that they had lost their first love. Does that not tell you and I something about importance of relationship? Our relationship with Jesus Christ, that first love? Let's, let's pause for a moment and, 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 and our thinking today and realize that just as he said we, they lost their first love. Is it possible we've lost that first moment of excitement we had for our spouse when we met them? Just think about it. I'm not saying you have. Just think about that. In online, after the message today, online you will find two surveys along with sermon notes and, and discussion questions. Uh, you'll find a 10 list things called the beginning. 10 things that what it was like in your dating years when you met each other. Answer those 10 questions. Don't do it together. Don't look at your wife. What would you put down for that one? Don't do that. <laughs> Make sure you're separate. Take the test. And then take the next quiz entitled today. The very same 10 questions are there. Now you are in a very honestly answer those 10 questions exactly the way you feel today as to pose that when you met and were dating before you were married. Then get together, compare your notes, and if you see a lot of changes, you know what that opens the door for? A lot of good conversation. Honey, we need to talk. <laughs> so when you compare that, hopefully it's going to be really, it wouldn't that be neat if you said, honey, look, we're doing better than we did when we were dating. It may not be so good if you say, honey, what's happened? We need to talk. That's exactly what you need to do. So let that be a good discussion. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, do you remember your vows? Do you remember your vows? What were they? Go ahead. Talk to me. What were some of them? Love, cherish. Oh, wow. Good stuff. Uh, here's the good old-fashioned tradition ones. Uh, for better, for worse. For richer, for. In sickness and in. No. Till death do us. Heart. Till, say till, death do us part. That's a promise. Why is it on Thursdays, it's been told to me, is the people filing for divorce, the longest line during the week is on Thursday when the court's open for that. Why is that? If it's till death do us part, if it's for better or worse, richer or poor, sickness or in health, you know, I had a couple come to me, and over the years, we saw something happen. More and more couples were wanting to write their own vows, and I was okay with that, because I knew how to build all this other in there anyways. 
And so I, I let them do that. I let them write their vows. Well, I had one couple that came to me and I read their vows and I says, uh-uh. I said, I can't do your wedding if that's how you feel. <laughs> they looked at me. I don't know if they copied them out of a book or what they did. I said, folks, these are the most selfish vows I've ever read. You made these vows about you. And that's not what marriage is. The marriage is what you plan to do with the person you're marrying. So I said, you need to go home and rewrite your vows, then come back. And that's exactly what happened. And they came back and they were approved. I approved them and we did the wedding. And they probably copied them out of a book. And today, the way people arrange for marriage is so different than what really is. So I ask, whatever happened to these vows, are they still true for you? Do we remember that we made these comments and these commitments before God, before each other, before family, and before friends? <laughs> I walked out of the house one day and said to my wife, Hon, I'm going to the church now to do the funeral. And I thought, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry, hon. It's the wedding. Why did I say funeral? And uh, was that an oxymoron? And I said, but you know what, hon? I think I'm going to use that mistake in the ceremony. Because let me tell you what marriage is. You ready? It is a dying to self. And you're opening yourself up to God. And you're opening yourself up to your spouse. You must die to self so that you can give yourself over to God and to your spouse. <laughs> you see, these were a promise. And I wrote a marriage manual here at the church, six of them actually, and one was entitled Divorce, Is It an Option? And we sold a lot of those, I gave a lot of them away. In fact, the district, uh, I gave one to the district official, he's asked me to get it in publication and he wants to give one to every minister in our district. And we can make it available for you. It, it's a good tool to have in your hands that if you ever contemplate divorce, read the manual first. And uh, it's very biblical. And the other thing is you might have a friend that needs to read that manual and, or talk to them about it. Very important today to stop this insanity of such long lines for people that are divorcing. So to get understanding of this, let's examine our salvation experience for a moment. Do you remember the joy? Do you remember the, the, uh, the burden that was lifted when Jesus took away your sins? Do you remember the excitement you felt, that clean, fresh feeling, at the time we spent with God, the people we told, and, and the love that we felt and that we had never felt before? Now think about marriage. Think about that. As we become one with Christ, we became one with each other. Hence, you felt joy. You felt that excitement, that time you spent with each other. And to be able to share that, that clean fresh, that love you had for each other. The same type of principles existed in you. There were three types of ceremonies that people would do at a wedding. They would do the candlelight or they would do the cord, tying the cord together, three strands, husband, wife, and Jesus Christ, knitting it together. Or they would use the sand. They'd put white in the bottom for God and they would pour the, the wife would pour a different color, the husband a different color, and they would mesh it together so they, they would show that they'd become one. Well, I enjoyed the candlelight, I think, the most because of what it showed us. Before the candlelight, or at the candlelight ceremony was over with, I'd say, do you remember those two flames that were flickering back and forth? They, they weren't, unless there was one strong wind that went through, they might have, but they were always just flickering doing their own thing. But when I had them light the center candle, and I preferred that they blow out the other two, not because they were losing their identity, but because they were saying they blended their identities together as one. And so I would wave my hand over the flame at the ceremony. I'd say, well, take a look at that. That flame isn't separating. It's staying together. So any pressure I put on my spouse, I'm just going to bend with it. Any on me, she's going to bend with it. It never separates because in the eyes of God, 
in the eyes of God and biblically speaking, we became one flesh. It is a mystery. It's hard to conceive of that, but in God's mind, that's what we are. One flesh. In Solomon, Solomon, Solomon chapter 2, verse 16, it says, my lover is mine and I am his. Now, that is so beautiful because that's, that's a given of oneself over to the other. That's why I said those marriage vows that you brought in, they don't work. Your vows have got to show where you're going to give yourself to them. I have couples right now. What do you expect of your spouse in marriage? Then I had them write down, what do you expect of yourself in this marriage? I wanted to make sure that they understood what their expectations were of themselves, not just what they would want from their spouse. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Enjoy life with your wife whom you love all, say all, all. the days, say days, days, of this meaningless life that God has given. Now, the rest of that verse says this. The wife God gives you is your reward for all your earthly toil. Hmm. What in the world does that word all mean? Did it mean a week? Did it mean a month? A year? Or did it mean as long as you both shall live? Just like the vows talk about. So you see the, the structure that God implanted in his word and, and mankind to know. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love all the days of your life. When I think of all the days of your life, I think of one thing. I'm going to live a certain amount of days, and then at the end of those days, there will be the end of my life. That means if I marry my wife there at this time, I'm to stay with her all the way to the end of the end of the days of my life. You know what the Bible was teaching about marriage? It was teaching the importance of longevity. You see, God never expects us and wants us to walk out of here and walk away from him, does he? He doesn't want that. But guess what? He designed marriage to be of such a nature based on the manual in the Bible that teaches us how not to walk away from each other as long as we both shall live. That's good to know. It implies longevity. It sounds like this is to be an all-time experience with, with the same person. Now, thank you, that was cute. <laughs> Things happen. We know that. Some of you are starting to maybe fidget a little bit. Pastor, but I've divorced and remarried. Some of you may be feeling that today. Now, I want you to know things do happen, unfortunately. And there is, there is divorce at times, but let, it, let the reason be biblical and none other. Folks, please let, please let the... Let it be biblical if there has to be divorce. If you say, Pastor, uh, I can't say it was necessarily biblical. It was just a terrible relationship that I'm remarried. What did I say at the beginning? You are married. Start building and rebuilding from where you are today. And everyone said. Amen. No, amen? No. Oh. You, you, you do want to rebuild and build from where you are. We had less people at, at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and they were louder than you. Amen. All right, come on now. What we're saying is get help before it gets to that place that you don't think it can be fixed. Folks, let me tell you something. I've read many, many books on marriage over the years to gain insight. And I'm going to tell you something. The best of all those books I read, the best one by far from the bottom of my heart, the best marriage manual of all those many books I read 
And I remember one time reading nine books just for one retreat to get information. But the one book that I read that gave the best information and the most concise and accurate information of all those books was the Bible. That was at the top of the list. And it's still at the top of my list. This book was written to fix our marriages. It was written to fix our families. It was written to fix our individual lives. It was written to save our lives. And it can save marriages. All right? It's part of that wedding covenant. So, uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 11. Come out, you daughters of Zion, and look at King Solomon wearing the crown, the crown with which his mother crowned him. On the day his heart rejoiced. Oh, that's so beautiful. Are you still rejoicing in your relationship? Are you still having fun? Are you still dating? Are you still making sure that you carve out the time that you need for each other? Today, with that which the Lord has crowned you with, see it as God crowned your life with your wife. See it as God crowned your life with your husband. And make sure that you are enjoying and rejoicing that you're still together. Chapter 8, verse 10, the last part, says this. I have become in his eyes like one bringing contentment. Whew. I have become in his eyes like one bringing to contentment. That's about being happy and being satisfied. Contentment. Being full and complete feeling. Okay? That's what the word contentment means. It, it speaks of action. It's like an active verb or something. Uh, working contentment, happiness, and satisfaction in your relationship. You were content with each other to begin with. I think when you go to do that first quiz, you're going to see how much contentment you had. How about today? How's the contentment? How happy are you? How satisfied are you? How complete? How full do you feel about your relationship? And we can't let all the distractions of the world infiltrate and keep us from thinking this way because we are the ones that are the last. I've done a chart, a timeline of Five timelines of relationships from beginning to grandparent years. I can make that available to anybody who wants one. I can make that available. This shows the steady line between a husband and wife all the way through to the end. And then all the distractions that are out there on the journey. Notice the phrasing, like bringing. That's an active word. Bringing contentment. You, you, you weren't supposed to just be content with the things that you had when you got married, we were supposed to keep contenting. Is that a word? Contenting each other. Making sure we're still bringing contentment to each other. We're supposed to still keep doing that. Bringing contentment, bringing happiness, bringing satisfaction, bringing fullness, completeness, bringing that joy. And, and, and in this way, do you see your spouse's needs? If you do, bring it on. Show that contentment for them. Meaning this, you're giving them the contentment they need. My wife takes so good care of me being a dialysis patient now. She is, I always tell the workers that at the dialysis on, I say my wife is my nurse, non-nurse. She doesn't have a degree in nursing, but boy, she knows nursing. She nurses me. She takes care of me. She knows what I should be eating. She knows what I, how I should be. She knows what the ramifications are of dialysis. She takes good care of me. She even, she even picks out my clothes sometimes. <laughs> she takes good care of me. Song of Solomon 8 says, and by the way, that brings great contentment. It brings great contentment to me. It brings joy, satisfaction, happiness. I'm not by myself in this dialysis journey. Place me like a sill over your heart, like a sill on your arms. For love is as strong as death. It's jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Mm, 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 mm. 
If that isn't love, I don't know what is. My wife broke up our engagement in Bible school because I was so jealous of other guys looking at her and smiling. I carried the Bible in one hand and a closed fist in the other one, ready to bop the guy <laughs> if they smile too long at my wife to be. And she said, I can't marry a jealous man. She gave the engagement ring back. I went to my knees that night, and cried out to God, literally on my face, crying out to God. And God gave me a flash in my childhood when one day we all got home from shopping and got out of the car and my mother said something to my dad, accusing him of being flirtatious with another woman and he started hitting on her. That left an indelible impression deep in my spirit that you can't trust men. And I'm a man, and you can't trust men. And my wife would say to me to be, she said, honey, if you really love me, you wouldn't have to worry. I said, honey, I, I don't have a problem loving you. I have a problem not trusting men. The way they look at you, I just didn't like it. And I got the victory that night on prayer, and here I stand 53 years later with the same beautiful bride. Now, I want you to go home and look up the word jealousy. You're going to find out it's not a pretty word. It's like ugly, really bad, very obsessive stuff. But the Hebrew word for jealousy in this verse meant something different. In the Hebrew, the word jealousy meant argent love, passionate, wholehearted love. It's like being totally sold out with your love for your spouse. Totally the opposite of the dictionary definition of the general word jealousy. Chapter eight, verse seven. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot wash it away. That's how strong that jealousy love is in us for our spouse. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot wash it away. Any marriage that is based on the attractiveness now, that attractiveness becomes the waters and the rivers that rush in our relationship. So any marriage that is based on the attractiveness of earthly possessions of either the husband or the wife is doomed to failure. Because what it says is, many waters cannot quench it. It says that if you don't let love block that, if you don't put up those barriers, if you don't put up those perimeters, if you don't guard your love and your heart, then those waters and rivers are going to rush in and wipe out your love for each other. With all the things and distractions and stuff in this world. See, water represents the stuff that we let flow into our relationship. And let's be honest and ask this today. Have we allowed to flood our relationship that threatens our love. What have we done? What kind of stuff could it be? Well, uh, time issues, you're too busy. You're not taking time with each other. Lack of communication, lack of devotions in your personal life and even together. Uh, money pressures, time to work long hours, maybe two jobs. Um, pleasures, projects, hobbies. You make your own list together. You, you need to do that. When you get done doing those 10 questions on each one of those tests, the beginning and today, if you see some areas that are out of balance, you need to sit down and start talking because I guarantee, I will promise you, I don't have my wallet. I will lay my credentials of the assemblies of God on this podium and leave them here and walk out today if I had them. If I didn't want to tell you but the truth, this Bible has the answer. It has the answer to your dilemmas. It has the answer. It has the answer. So, true love stands the test of all the rivers and waters that want to rush in and take over your life. Proverbs 18, 22. He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. He further says in 518 of Proverbs, May your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice, say rejoice, in the wife of your youth. Angela and I were talking this week and I said, Hon, I don't know what I would do 
without you. I can't imagine living life without you. She said, I can't imagine living life without you. I said, honey, you know how I pray? How? I pray that we get to be together at the rapture. That neither one of us has to go before, unless that's God's plan. And he'll take care of us if that's what happens. But wouldn't that be neat to have hand in hand with your spouse, going up to heaven, raised before God, and even seeing your family and friends joining together? Wouldn't that be cool? Now, Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 through 16, says something very, very important. And it says something about those who tend to get hurt the worst. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears, you weep and wail, because he no longer looks on you with favor or your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask why? It is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Who witnessed our wedding? Say it. God. We made a promise to God. Listen to this. It is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. He's still a witness that we promised you. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. And I want you to believe something with me today, if you will. I want to apply that word unfaithful. I, I, I think it's going to bend toward stepping outside of the marriage relationship, but I also think it can include unfaith being unfaithful in the light of not keeping the promises we made to each other before God that we haven't followed through on all those promises. We haven't been faithful to all those things. I think we should apply it that way. He, is, he has not the one God made you. You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? <laughs> what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be in favor to the wife of your youth. The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God, the man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord God, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect. Your spouse, your little ones, says the Lord Almighty. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. Listen, how are we going to carry on the church in the future if we don't guard the little ones God has given us? with the right definition of marriage. How are we going to carry on the church? Godly offspring. You know what? A son of twins, 36 years old, were being talked to, communicate with, ask questions about their, what's it like being twins? Now that you're 36 years old, what's life been like? What would you say is the hardest thing you can remember? Do you know what they said? The hardest thing they experienced at the age of 36 was the divorce of their parents when they were little girls. Still remembering the pain. Guard your spirit, folks. Guard your spirit. And everyone said, Amen. you see, does this sound like God wants your marriage to fail? Guard your spirit. Marriage is a lot of work. Listen. When God put marriage together, you don't think he knew what was going to happen? God, you don't think he didn't know what was going to happen? He didn't know you were going to have bad hair days? You don't think he didn't know you were going to argue? You're going to fight, you're going to carry on, you're going to make mistakes? You don't think God didn't know that? Folks, that's why he wrote the marriage manual. Among many other reasons. That's one reason he wrote it. So he got something to go to. You got something, you know what, it, it, listen, people would ask, how come your marriage has been so successful? You know what my wife said out of her mouth before I could say it? And she said exactly what I was going to say, because we went to God and we went to the word and we talked and we communicated and we worked it out with God. We went to the word of God. I couldn't believe she said that so quickly because that's exactly what I was going to say. I want to be the first one to say it. But she said it as fast as because she said it. And we had the same answer. We had the same answer. Because we always went to God. We prayed. We read the word. We studied the word. We knew what the word said. Yes, the marriage book's up. Don't stop reading a good marriage book. But folks, the, the best one is still the Bible. You, if, if you don't read it, you don't know what I'm talking about today. 
that if you will read it and think about marriage and family as you read it and your children, you will be amazed the answers God had. So where do we start? Well, let's go back to chapter 2, verse 16. My lover's mine, and I'm his. Looking at this closer, it means we belong to each other. Let me read something to you here uh, out of 1 Corinthians 5. Uh, the verse, I'm sorry, chapter 7. And first five verses. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have such relations with a woman. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relationships with his own wife. See, that's fornication, to have sex with somebody outside of marriage. Sexual relations with his own wife. But if you can't, then have your own wife. And each woman, her own husband. Listen to this. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife. And likewise, the wife to her husband. And it's talking about an intimacy, an act of love. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the, the authority over her own body, but yields it to her, her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Now, if we was at a marriage retreat with just the couples, we'd have a lot of fun with that. That subject, let me tell you. Do not deprive. Stop saying I got a headache tonight. <laughs> Men, Pull yourself away from the TV and bond with your wife. Do not deprive each other. Amen. Amen is right. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consentment for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I tell you what, whoo, baby, that is some hot stuff. That's good stuff. God, I hope kids are listening. Don't be covering your kids' ears. God created sex, and it is beautiful. It is wonderful. It is to be enjoyed. But don't do it the way the world talks about it. Do it the way the Bible talks about it. And you'll have no need, no desire for anybody else in your life but the one you married. And everyone said Chapter 2, verse 14b, we're getting near the end here. Chapter, four, chapter 2, verse 14 of Song of Solomon gives us the answer to what I think is the best, best communication you'll ever find anywhere else in all the marriage books and in Scripture. I think it's the best one I've ever read. Ready? Show me your face. Let me hear your voice. When you're at a restaurant, would you quit texting each other across the table? There, there's commercials about that. Show me your face. Let me hear your voice. Not through the newspaper. Yeah, what's up, hon? Huh? Huh? Yeah, I did, I did. Or a book that you're reading that you seem to can't put down. A project you're working on. Not while you're watching TV. Ah, I want to see this play. <laughs> Not trying to pick out men. Women, you do it too. Not while online or the phone. I love this. Not Facebook. Not texting. But face to face. Let me tell you something about Angela, but don't tell her I told you. When we would have a disagreement going on, and these were days when I was definitely more insecure. God healed me of a lot of insecurities. You heard my testimony that we shared a while back. And uh, if we had an argument going on, I would think I was winning if she wasn't anywhere around, if she just walked away. I might have, yeah, you know, who knows what I've done. Not Angela. <laughs> Stood right in front of me. 
Hon, I don't even know if you remember these times. Don't say yes out loud. <laughs> she would get in my face and just look me in the eyes and would not flinch and told me like it was what I needed to hear. And when I said, I don't need to hear this, I know what you're going to say. She tricked me one day and said, so tell me, what am I going to say? I had, I was so far off, it wasn't funny. So I learned you keep your mouth shut till she's done and you process it after she's done before you speak. Remember the Bible says in James, quick to hear, slow to speak. But do you know what? I'm indebted to her for doing that to me. She was practicing God's word. Isn't this, isn't this beautiful? Show me your face. Honey, I want to talk to your face. I don't want to talk through the newspaper or, or a game on TV. or I don't want to walk through your phone or your, whatever you're doing. No. All right. You keep, because it's, now we're being physical with each other. We're, we're present. We're being verbal. We're hearing each other talk. It's showing love, and it opens the door to an emotional response to the one we love. Look at me. It's communication with the eyes. Then let me hear your voice. Talk to me. This is verbal communication. And when we begin to open up our emotions, become engaged. And we begin to break. We begin to be apologetic or whatever we need to do. No matter if there is some rough spots in the communication, there is communication happening. I remember one time a couple was come to see me and for three hours, just their time, not my time. We went over three hours. For three hours, they argued with each other back and forth. I've had couples come to me and I let them have at it. Don't get scared. I don't allow bad stuff to happen. No one pulls out a, a bat or a rolling pin, nothing like that. I allow them to have at it and they will go at it for a while. The voices are raised. I remember one time my assistant had to leave the office because like a couple I had was so loud. She couldn't concentrate. I let, I let them do it. And when I get done, I'd say, you know, I'd say to these couples, well, praise God. I said, this was the best session we've ever had. And they looked at me like, why in the world are we coming to you for help? I said, do you know what you just did? You opened up. Now I know what's bothering you. Now I can help. You see, they dumped it all out. They all let it hang out. And you finally got to see the depth of what was going on, which could take you back to experiences in their lives, such as I had, to get over the, the, the victory over jealousy. It opens the world in counseling. It opens the Pandora's box for digging deeper into what is the real root cause for your relationship. Listen, let me tell you something. People come to me and they want me to fix their marriage. I flip it upside down. No, it, let's fix your upbringing. Let's fix your personality differences. Let's fix your love language. And guess what? You're going to find out you only got marriage problems this bad. You think they're this bad, but let's fix the upbringing. Let's know our love language. Let's know our personality difference. Let's fix those things of the individual and you'll find out marriage will work. Oh, but I'm gonna want, they want the answer in the first session. Ain't going to happen in my office. Not going to happen in the first session. Unless there's a mighty move of God and some kind of an admission and, and breaking, so be it. But other than that, mm -mm. so let me help you with something. You know what the word intimacy actually means? Intimacy has to do with you being very vulnerable and endearing with each other. And someone penned it this way. The word intimacy means into me see. We know it's spelled C-Y at the end of intimacy, but the idea was I want to hear from you in such a way and I want to talk to you in such a way that we can see into each other. You know, I tell people there's three basic lines of communication. Peripheral. Hon, did you get the milk? Yes. Hon, did you get the cleaner? Yes. How was your day? It was great. Then there's what I call the emotional level. Hey, hon, how was your day? And at that point, there can be a purging of some feelings. 
becomes more emotional level, gets below the surface level. But then there's what I call the weeping level, where if your spouse needs to share, shed some tears, now you've really opened yourself, become vulnerable to the deeper level of how you feel. These are important levels of communication. So you didn't get to know each other completely before marriage, did you? No doubt you learned a lot, but more was discovered as time went by. You didn't know each other fully. You thought you did. And it caused you to start thinking differently as you discovered more about each other. That's why your test could be a little different. But listen, just like spiritually accepting Christ, we didn't know a lot about God or Scripture, did we? Come on, you know you know more today than you did then. But did we ever see Christ divorce himself from us? So why should I divorce my wife if we're having disagreements? We've done things that God would disagree with, but he hasn't divorced us, has he? So I don't need to run to the divorce court every time I think something's wrong that can't be fixed. But he loved us into change. And he communicated that through his word. So today, look each other in the face and begin to hear each other's voice and speak the truth in love. So how should you lead today? Okay, I'm glad you asked. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 10. My lover said to me, rise up. Angela, my darling, come away with me, my fair one. Forever, by the way. Takeaways. Whatever is your state today, rebuild from there. Have on a regular basis a face-to-face -face method of communicating. Bring contentment and happiness, satisfaction, fullness, and completeness to each other. And know that the one you talk to the most in life is the one you become closest to. It's how you get close to God, and it's how you get close to each other. I talk a lot to God. I talk a lot to my wife. So the ones I talk to the most are the ones I will be closest to. How close do you want to be today? And everyone said, let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you for this opportunity to deal with a subject that uh, I hope was helpful. And if it didn't need to be said for some because they are where they need to be, so be it. Praise God. And if there's work to be done, then so be it. Let's get it fixed, Lord. Your word does show us how. And those listening online and those here today, I will be glad to answer questions, text questions, questions on email, anything I can do, Lord, to help. I just pray, Lord, that you will give them a comfortable ability to be able to get the help they need. No marriage, unless it's a biblical reason, has to fail because you are there to build us up. And all God's people prayed in Jesus' name. Amen, and God bless you, folks. We love you. Thank you so much for letting me preach today.